In the Final Fantasy franchise, one game stands above the rest is not only the highest rated, but also the personal favorite of both the series creator and composer, and was stated to be the closest to an ideal view of what a Final Fantasy game should be like. A game released on the PlayStation, often lauded for its groundbreaking graphics and a story that is both complex and thought-provoking, featuring an amnesiac protagonist with blonde hair on a quest to save the world from an arrogant silver-haired twink with a god complex. That's right, Final Fantasy 7. 9, it's 9, okay, could we just not talk about 7 for one goddamn second? Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Released in the year 2000, Final Fantasy IX was immediately met with high praise due to its well-developed characters, amazing CG, and a beautiful soundtrack that you've come to expect from the legend Uematsu. But despite the critical acclaim, it was never able to reach the level of sales of its predecessors and quickly fell into obscurity. So what caused Final Fantasy IX to become the black sheep in a golden era of Final Fantasy games? Well, after the futuristic settings of 7 and 8, Square Enix wanted to return the series' roots with 9 and create a game set back in the medieval ages. The problem is, this was the early 2000s, the emo subculture was in its prime and people willingly listened to Eminem. It was a dark dark and, dare I say, edgier time, and kids wanted their games to be more mature to reflect that. Nobody wanted to play with mages and knights anymore, they wanted gun blades and Mako reactors and really bad breast physics. When Final Fantasy IX rolled around, many were put off by the game's seemingly childish aesthetic. Coupled together with it being released on a system that was practically on life support meant it was almost doomed from the start. However, those who did play Final Fantasy IX quickly realized that its friendly exterior was really just a thinly veiled cover-up for the giant box of depression hidden within. But I know not everyone has the time or patience to play through 40 hours of random encounters, excruciatingly long summoning cutscenes, and goddamn jump roping. So for those who never played the game, or have and were thoroughly confused by the babble about crystals, souls, and genomes, I will attempt to summarize four discs worth of extensive plot and dialogue into a quick 10 minute video. Here we go. When a person is born, they receive their soul from a crystal deep in the plant's core, and when they die, their soul returns back to said crystal. This is a plant's soul cycle and is what keeps the planet healthy and, well, not dead. But if a plant's crystal gets all weak and sickly, then the soul cycle stops and life pretty much comes to an end, which is exactly what's happening on a planet called Terra. Naturally, the people of Terra weren't too thrilled about the whole end of the world thing, so they came up with a plan to take their dying crystal and shove it into a healthy new planet, restarting the soul cycle and bringing all the dead people back to life. So the people of Terra put their souls in a temporary stasis and create an android named Garland to take them and the crystal to a new planet where life can be reborn. Garland searched the galaxy for a couple thousand years but has a hard time finding one that's uninhabited and eventually settles on one named Gaia. The only problem is Gaia is already populated with humans and rat people and whatever Quinn is supposed to be. And to take control of a planet's soul cycle, the new planet needs to be completely empty or it's just gonna be like, hey, I've already got my own thing going on, so uh, no thanks. Left with no better options, Garland attempts the fusion anyways, and the weaker Terran crystal ends up getting totally rejected. The old planet of Terra gets reborn in the core of Gaia, but really small like a Tootsie Pop. With the assimilation ending in a failure, Garland moves on to step two of his plan of abduction for dummies guidebook. He plops down a giant tree that reaches all the way down the crystals and acts as a filter for the soul cycle, keeping the souls of Gaia from returning to the crystal and only letting Terran souls be reborn. The lost Gaian souls get expelled into the atmosphere, covering most of the planet in a deep mist, with it being especially dank on the mist continent which I'm going to assume was named because of all the mist. Or maybe it was already named the mist continent and the mist was just like, oh sick, yeah, I'm gonna just, I'm just hang out right here, cool. Anyways, mist really sucks. You put an animal into it, they turn to a significantly more evil version of that same animal. And if you inhale too much, you go crazy and want to commit atrocities like killing the innocent or playing gotcha games. As Garland waits for the mist monsters to kill everyone, he creates these things called genomes, which are pretty much humans but with tails and more empty inside than your average college student. Their only purpose in life is to be the new bodies for the people of Terra when their souls are finally ready to be reborn, so for now they just kind of pace back and forth for the next millennium. A couple thousand years pass and Garland realizes that the mist really isn't doing that much. Everyone just moved their homes on top of mountains and the Kingdom of Limbloom even found a way to use mist to power airships. Which is only slightly messed up when you realize they're pretty much using tormented human souls as a renewable resource. To help speed up the whole extinction process, Garland creates a new genome named Kuja, whose job is to go down to Gaia and incite wars between the kingdoms. Despite looking like a cheap male stripper, Kuja is actually super powerful and is the only genome that isn't literally brain dead. However, Kuja possessed one fatal flaw and that he's unable to activate Trance, which is basically this game's version of Super Saiyan or Limit Break, except he can't really control when it activates, meaning most of the time it gets wasted on some innocent woodland creatures. Except the sheep. Those things will fucking end you. So, like the caring father he is, Garland tosses Kudra in the trash and creates a new genome, with the hopes that this one could activate trance and maybe not grow up to look like your neighborhood sex offender. Seeing how much fun Garland was having with his new son, Kudra gets super jealous and kicks him off the spaceship. Naturally, this doesn't go too well with Papap, who disowns Kudra and banishes him from Terra and his super cool spaceship. Filled with unbridled teen angst, Kudra wanders Gaia in search of a power strong enough to overthrow Garland. 
Eventually he arrives in the city of Medain Sari, where a race of people called summoners live. Along with having super cool horns, they also possess the ability to summon giant monsters called Eidolons, that can either have the power to destroy entire cities or do 500 damage depending on whether or not you're in a cutscene. Before Kujin can get his hands on an Eidolon for himself, Garland swoops in on his ship and destroys the whole city. During the attack, a mother and her child escape the burning city by boat and land in the kingdom of Alexandria. The mother dies on the voyage while the child is found by the queen and adopted to be the new princess. The queen chops off her summoner horn and gives her the new name Garnet Tiz Alexandros the 17th, as opposed to her old one which was just Sarah. The only other surviving summoner is a child named Aiko, who now lives alone in the ruins of Medain Sari with a bunch of flying hamster babies. Meanwhile, Kooch is not too happy about having his new toys taken away and now wants an Eidolon more than ever. But with the entire summoner population being seemingly wiped out, that's become pretty darn difficult. After a quick search on Mooglepedia, he learns that there existed an Eidolon so overpowered and meta-breaking that the summoners had to split its crystal into four shards and hide them across the continent. One shard is with Garnet and Alexandria, one with Aiko and Maiden Sari, one in Limbloom, and one in Clara. Because he's too lazy to go look for the shards himself, Kooch comes up with a plan to manipulate the Queen of Alexandria into conquering the entire continent and just kind of taking the shards from her after she's done all the hard work. He brainwashes her into turning into a Disney villain and using the mist he creates an army of soulless black mages that she can use as pawns to wage her wars. While an airship is delivering black mages to Alexandria, one falls off and is found by an elderly frog guy named Quan. He initially plans to eat it, but decides not to because it's just too darn cute. Instead he names it Vivi and raises the mage as if it was his own grandson. He teaches Vivi all about the outside world and miraculously, he somehow develops emotions and becomes sentient. After Quan passes away, Vivi decides to venture out and see the world with his own glowing yellow eyes. Oh yeah, remember this little guy? Well after being kicked off Garland's spaceship, a group of bandits found him and named him Zidane. Or Zidon, if you're one of the five people who played Dissidia. They raised him as one of their own and trained him to be a mischievous and for some reason very horny thief. Hey look at that, we're finally at the start of the game. It only took like 20 minutes. After all the mind control shenanigans, Queen Braun is starting to go a little cuckoo for Kuja Puffs. So in order to keep Garnet and her crystal shards safe, the region of Limbloom hires Zidane and his band of thieves to kidnap her and bring her back to Limbloom. Zidane sneaks into the castle and meets Garnet who conveniently enough was already running away so the two agree to a good old wholesome kidnapping. They chase her in the castle by Steiner, an Alexandrian general who is the biggest Queen Braun stay in the kingdom. And on the way back to his airship, they also bump into Vivi who's just kinda there to see the play but ends up getting caught up in all the hubbub. Wacky hijinks ensue and the four end up getting blasted out to the continent. Just like that we've got our four party members stuck out in the open and forced to cooperate. Garnet wants to go get help from Limbloom to stop the queen, Steiner wants to return the princess to Alexandria, Vivi wants to explore the world, and Zidane wants to touch Garnet's butt. Ultimately, they decide to follow Garnet to Limbloom, and along the way they stop in the seemingly quiet village of Dolly to search for an airship. The villagers kidnap Vivi and bring him to an underground factory where he sees the black mage is being created from mist. The party searches the town and eventually find him, but after seeing clones of himself being made on an assembly line, he begins to wonder if he truly isn't human and after all. Back on the surface, they steal an Alexandrian airship and land in Limbloom. Garnet meets with the regent, Sid the Ninth. Get it? Because this is Final Fantasy IX, there's a Sid in every game. <laughs> Who's now a weird bug thing because his mage wife caught him cheating. Instead of immediately mobilizing an army to stop Alexandria, Sid forces everyone to participate in his completely nonsensical hunting festival, which involves releasing a bunch of wild animals into the streets and endangering all the defenseless citizens of his kingdom. Hey, I'm beginning to see why his wife left him. So Zidane and Vivi enter the tournament, fight a walrus horse, and return to Sid only to learn that nearby city of Bermesia is getting invaded by black mages. Zidane agrees to help, but tells Garnet to stay back so that she doesn't get hurt. Garnet gets all pouty and laces their food with sleeping weed, knocking the entire party out beside Steiny Boy. While the party is unconscious, Garnet and Steiner travel back to Alexandria to try to convince the queen to maybe not commit genocide of an entire population. It goes about as well as expected. Hey, did you guys see her blue skin? I think she might be beyond reasoning. After waking up from their drug-induced nap, Vivi and Zidane travel to Vermicia with their new rat friend Freya as a guide. This is right by the point of the story where it turns from fantasy fun time to genocide simulator 2000. When the three arrive, they find the Vermesians getting slaughtered left and right by black mages. And even worse, everyone's being really mean to Vivi just because he looks exactly similar to the people destroying the city. Making their way past the black mages and stepping over a few rat bodies, they find Braun talking with one of her generals, Vitrix, and Kuja who's just kind of in the back spouting confusing metaphors. Oh yeah, just like everyone else we've met so far, Zidane is a case of the convenient plot amnesia, so he doesn't remember anything about Kuja or the fact that he's supposed to be like an angel of death or whatever. Are heroes eavesdrop and overhear their plans to attack the neighboring city of Clara, where they suspect one of the crystal shards is being held. But before they can leave, a Bermesian soldier challenges Beatrix to a fight and the party is forced to jump in and protect them. They lose. Bad. 
And when I say bad, I mean like scripted loss bad. Kuja does a cool hair flip and flies off the Claire on his dragon that he just has now, I guess. Meanwhile, back in Alexandria, Steiner is still locked in prison and Garnet is having that Dolan sucked out of her by some Kefka cosplayers. So all in all, not really the best day for our protagonist. Zidane, Vivi, and Freya pick their shattered egos off the ground and head to Claire to try to stop the incoming evasion. They warn the Promethians and Freya joins them in doing a ritual dance that does absolutely nothing. Just then, Beatrix crashes through the window and nabs the summoning shard and casually walks out the door. They try to stop her, but once again get their asses clapped. She escapes to a nearby airship where Bronn is waiting with the new Eidolon powers that she sucked out of Garnet. Despite both Promethean cities being in shambles and their summoning shard being stolen, which might I remind you was the whole reason they attacked the city in the first place, Bronn says screw it and summons a giant horse nuke wiping the entire kingdom off the face of the planet. Even the super loyal Beatrix thinks it was completely unnecessary and understandably starts to question the queen's sanity. Using some black mage teleporters, the party is able to get back to Alexandria before Bronn and her fleet arrive. They reunite with Steiner and find Garnet passed out in the ritual chambers. After curb stomping some clowns, they bring Garnet upstairs where Bronn and Beatrix are waiting for them. Once again, they fight Beatrix and this time are finally able to defeat and now just play in the But after seeing the princess all dead and stuff, she finally accepts that the queen is totally insane and turns sides against Alexandria. Freya joins her as the two hold off the incoming wave of monsters while the rest escape. In a rare change of heart, Steiner entrusts the princess to Zidane and opts to stay behind to fend off the Alexandrian troops, who are all wearing one pieces because Japan. The rest of the party take a mole cricket ride out of the kingdom and arrive in the forest near Limbloom. Garnet is visited by an Eidolon who gives her back her summoner powers in exchange for reading his fanfiction. Just as things are starting to calm down, surprise, Bronn is back and she's ready to nuke more towns with her Eidolons. After nearly half of Limbloom gets swallowed up by a giant Atmos summon, the party decides that it might be easier to stop Kuja first, since he's the one creating black mages from the mist then even if they did kill Bronn, Kuja would probably just find another world leader to manipulate. Sid informs them that the mist is rumored to be created on the outer continent, but to get there they have to pass through an underground tunnel that's located in Quay's Marsh. It's here that they meet a local named Quinna, who is pretty much the Jar Jar Binks of Final Fantasy IX. He, uh, likes eating. That's his character. Quinna chases around a frog and unintentionally finds the entrance to the underground tunnel. Making their way through the cave, they arrive in the settlement of Conde Petty, a town full of dwarves who all speak in thick Scottish accents. Actually, that's every dwarf ever. N never mind. Zidane spots a black mage buying groceries in town, and they chase it through a nearby forest. On the other side, the party is shocked to find themselves in a village full of sentient black mages, all like Vivi, who defected from the Alexandrian army and wished to live in peace. Vivi has a heart-to-heart -heart with the village leader and learns that black mages are created only to have around a year lifespan until they eventually shut down, because apparently he needed even more existential dread to worry about. The next morning, Garnet hears from the villagers that the source of the mist is coming from the nearby Aoife tree, but to gain access to the tree, the dwarves require that you be married. Zidane and Garnet go through with the marriage ritual, and yes, so do Vivi and Quinna. While it's completely optional, how could you not? On the path to the Aoife tree, they run into Aiko, who despite only being 6 years old, can already summon Eidolons and is ready and willing to go on a perilous journey to save humanity with a bunch of strangers that she just met, which I know is pretty much standard for RPG characters, but let me remind Mind you, she's six. When I was six, I was eating glue and watching Spongebob, but I also couldn't summon Bahuma in my living room, so maybe that changes people. Eiko takes them to the Aoife tree, where they destroy a second, smaller tree at the bottom, which stops the mist from being spread across the continent, meaning no more black mages, and also everyone who's flying in a mist-powered airship at the time is probably dead. With the mist stopped and the world saved, the party returns to Main Sari and live happily ever after. Oh fuck, is that early 2000s alt-rock I hear? Yeah, you thought you can get through a Final Fantasy game without an edgelord joining the party? Nah, Amaranth's here, and he's ready to kidnap children and steal crystals, I guess. I mean, he, he doesn't either. He kind of, he, he, he sucks. But he does join the party. Uh yeah, just get on the bench over there, please. The crew travels back to the Eva tree and waits for Kuja to show up and advance the plot. Right on cue, he begins his routine monologue, but is thankfully stopped when Bronn shows up with the entire Alexandrian fleet. She summons Bahumad and tries to kill Kuja because, uh, reasons. And the two of an epic dragon showdown until Garland flies in and mind controls Bahumat. How can it do that? I don't know, alien technology, I guess. Bahuma turns on Bronn, uh, okay, that didn't sound good, and destroys the entire Alexandrian fleet, bringing her down with it. As she takes her last breath, her mind is finally free from insanity, and she entrusts the kingdom of Alexandria to her daughter. Garnet takes the throne as the new queen, and everyone is happy for her except for Zidane, who's all, No, you're so sexy, don't leave the party, Oh. However, because this is Final Fantasy IX and 5 seconds can't go by without a kingdom being destroyed, Kuja shows up in Alexandria and begins blowing everything up with Bahumat. In order to protect the city, Aiko and Garnet combine all four of the crystal shards and summon Alexander, which, I shit you not, is the entire goddamn castle. I don't know how they got away with hiding that. Anyways, Bahumat is destroyed and the kingdom of Alexandria is saved for like 2 minutes until Garland blows everything up again. So close. This makes Kuja pretty mad at Garland because he wanted to use the power of Alexander to take over the world. I guess he just expected Garland to mind control Zappin and hand it over to him even though they've been beefing for the entirety of the game? 
Well, I guess that's exactly what he did with Bahamut, but still. As Kuja escapes on his airship, Sid, who's now a frog, not a bug, long story, spots some of the Black Mage villagers following him inside. The party returns to Black Mage Village to investigate and learn that most of the villagers left after Kuja promised them eternal life in exchange for their services. Which, of course, was a lie because Kuja's a big dickhead. Deep in the desert, they find the entrance to Kuja's secret underground hideout and fall right into his trap. Kuja's new evil scheme is to suck the Eidolons out of Eiko, just like what Bronn did to Garnet. But to complete the ritual, he needs a special stone that's hidden in some ruins that have an anti-magic barrier around them. And because Kuja has the muscular development of a prepubescent teen, he makes Zidane and three of his more burly friends get it for him. While the Muscle Brigade is having Terra's lore explained to them by some creepy wallheads, Sid no clips out of his cell and frees the rest of the party. The whole squad reunites to confront Kuja, but before they can stop him, Aiko gets kidnapped. Kuja uses the force to steal the magic stone from Zidane and flies off to the Lost Continent. They take Aiko to an underground ritual site and begin the extraction process. But because she's under 16, the ritual fails and only causes her pain. With no fucks left to give, Kuja orders the clown crew to kill her in order to get her Eidolons. As a last resort, Aiko's pet Moogle enters trance, revealing itself to be the Eidolon Maydeen, enclosed in tiny hamster form by the summoners to watch over Aiko. Maydeen unleashes her ultimate attack, sacrificing herself in the process in order to protect Aiko. The rest of the party catches up and Kuja scurries away saying something about having found the way to activate trance or something, I don't know. After a bit of searching, they find Sid's wife imprisoned in the hideout. Unsurprisingly, Kuja explained his whole evil plot to her, including all of its weaknesses during one of his many unprovoked evil speeches. She turns Sid back into a human and reveals that the secret to opening a gate to Terra is in a weird upside down castle on the Forgotten Continent. Garnet gives herself a symbolic haircut and the crew flies over to Ibsen's castle. When they arrive, Amaranth runs in ahead to prove a point that he doesn't need any friends. Wait. Who let Amaran off the bench in the first place? Zidane finds four plot mirrors and saves Amaran after he gets beat up by monsters off screen. Guess I need friends after all. <laughs> Yeah, cool character arc, Amaran. Now get back on the bench. So to open a portal to Terra, each of the four plot mirrors need to be placed in four different shrines all at the same time. So the party splits into pairs, and of course, Quinna is stuck with the player, because the game needed a reason to make you use them. After placing down the four mirrors, the portal to Terra opens up, and everyone jumps inside. When they arrive, Zidane sees a girl, and like the horny fuckboy he is, follows her deep into the unknown. He soon finds himself in the city of Bran Bull, where all the genomes have been living for the past thousand years. The girl brings Zidane to Garland, who explains his origins and his purpose is the bringer of death on Gaia, and asks Zidane to take his place beside him as the ruler of the galaxy. Zidane swiftly tells him to fuck off, prompting Garland to mind zap him in an attempt to revert his memories back to being an empty genome. Zidane wakes up to the sounds of Aiko and Vivi calling his name, but after all he's seen and heard, he now accepts his existence as an enemy to Gaia, and believes himself unworthy to walk beside the people he once called friends. Leaving the two behind, he attempts to escape Terra alone, but finds himself unable to fend off the incoming wave of monsters all by himself. One by one, his companions jump in to lend a hand, reminding him that he doesn't have to face his problems alone, and that he should learn to rely on them, just like they relied on him. And I don't give a damn if you think this sounds corny, it's powerful. It's powerful. Together, they make their way to Garland for one final battle. But before they can land the finishing blow, Kucha flows nonchalantly down and kicks him off the space... Uh, lily pad thing. With Garland now out of the picture, Kuja starts to gloat about being the new ruler of Terra. However, like a bad rash that you can't get rid of, Garland's voice lingers on, telling Kuja that he was created to be mortal, just like everyone else, and that his life was put on a timer to end whenever Zidane surpassed him in power. Kuja starts turning red, also like a bad rash, and enters his transform. Turns out that when Garland was zapping all those kingdoms, his ship was absorbing all the souls of the people it destroyed, and Kuja absorbed them all, allowing himself to finally activate trance. While he now possesses near godlike powers, he finds them meaningless if he just gonna die like everyone else anyways. Ah, uh, classic case of the nihilism. Don't worry Kuja, we've all been there. In a fit of rage, he begins destroying Terra as Zidane rounds up the genomes and escapes on Garland's ship just in time before the planet collapses completely. With his temper tantrum now over, Kuja returns to Gaia and straight up rips a hole in time and space, leading back to the origins of the universe. Which, yes, is of course, a crystal. But not just any crystal, this one's like two times bigger than average. The party follows him back in time, witnessing the birth and assimilation of Gaia, and eventually finding Kuja at the end about to destroy the universe crystal. They beat up his demon moth and beat up his demon self, but before he's defeated, Kuja uses his ultimate spell, destroying himself and putting the party on the brink of death. Speaking of death, did you know this game is a surprise final boss? Literally, death itself comes out from the void to bring the world back to zero, an existence of nothingness where no one has to suffer or be afraid of dying. After taking a few grand crosses to the face, the party ultimately defeats it and the world around them starts to collapse. Suddenly, an unknown force teleports them to Gaia and in front of the Aoife tree. Using their telepathic brotherly connection, Kuja speaks with Zidane from the bottom of the Aoife tree, revealing that he was the one who had teleported them away after finally realizing the mistakes of his actions. Zidane being the good guy that he is, can't help but try to save Kuja despite everything that he's done to the planet, his friends, and, and well, pretty much everyone. 
Zidane says his goodbyes to Garnet and thanks Vivi for teaching him the importance of life, before journeying down to the Aoife tree in a poorly rendered cutscene. He finds Kuja at the bottom, who insists that he is beyond saving and that the world would be better off without him. But Zidane refuses to give up on his brother, telling him that he still has time to make up for its actions. But suddenly, the Aoife tree collapses on the two of them and the screen fades to black. Everyone is gathering in the now rebuilt Alexandria to see a play ran by Zidane's crew. Cutscenes play catching us up on what has changed since the Aoife tree's collapse. Steiner and Beatrice got together, Aiko was adopted by Sid and his wife, Quinna became the castle's head cook, Freya reunited with her long lost love, and even Amaranth found a friend to stick by his side. Besides Zidane, the only party member missing is Vivi, who is instead represented by a group of similar looking black mages claiming to be Vivi's sons. A letter is read in between scenes with the writer thanking Zidane while also giving their final farewells. If you could somehow read the letter between the tears flowing down your eyes, then it becomes clear the one writing the letter is Vivi himself, with his short lifespan having come to an end not long after the final battle. The play begins and Garnet watches intently from her balcony. As it nears its conclusion, the lead star throws off their cloak, revealing themselves to be Zidane himself, who miraculously survived the Aoife tree's collapse, all so he could see his princess one more time. Garnet dashes through the crowd and leaps into his arms as everyone celebrates the two lovers' heartfelt reunion. Credits play. Wait, hold on, we're not done yet. Let's take a second to talk about the major themes of Final Fantasy IX, because I think that, more than anything else, is a big reason why this game had such a lasting impact on everyone who played it, even 20 years after its release. While the game dives deep into many different themes, I find the major one to be about life and death, and coming to terms with your own mortality. This is highlighted primarily through Kuja and Vivi, with the two serving as contrast to each other over the course of the story. When Kuja learns that he has a fixed lifespan, he rebels against death itself and tries to destroy all of humanity, believing that life is meaningless if one is doomed to die anyways. Similarly, Vivi learns early on that his life is on a fixed timer, but through the advice of Zidane and his friends, he ultimately decides to make the most of his short life, and spends it protecting those that he cares about the most. Both were created for the wrong reasons, to be disposable weapons of war, but the way each handles the cards they were dealt leads one to live a life full of hatred and destruction, while the other lives a meaningful life helping those that they love. Nobody lives forever, and you can either spend the short time you have on this planet in constant fear of death, or you can embrace it and make the most out of each and every day. That's what Final Fantasy IX has to say, and sometimes it takes hearing it from a 20 year old game to finally come to terms with it for yourself. Or at least, that's how it was for me. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this style of video, I would super appreciate it if you could subscribe. I plan on making a bunch more of these kind of videos, mostly for RPGs because they're my favorite, but if you have a certain game you'd like to see done, then just leave a comment telling me what it is and if there's anything you'd like to see improved from this one, because, you know, I, I know it's super sloppy, but I hope to improve a lot by the next one. Uh, not really sure how to end the video. Just, uh, subscribe. I don't have anything to link. Just, <laughs> if you like, subscribe. That's all I care about. Thanks, bye.